Hello and welcome to Not Overthinking. Tamo, how are you doing today? I'm not doing too badly. It's been a long time since we've done this. Feels like many weeks. It feels like many weeks indeed. Um, I, th I feel like this episode should we, we, we should do a few updates. So what's, what's going on with our members community? Yeah, so if you don't know, for the past few months, we've been sort of experimenting with having kind of like a paid membership to Not Overthinking, where we have like a members community with a Slack group, organize events, things like that. Uh, I don't think it went so well. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I don't think it went so well. I think it started off with good intentions. Uh, of like, oh, it'd be really cool if we had this thing where we can meet up with people once a week on Zoom calls and stuff. Mm. Um, but as I've also realized with my part-time YouTuber Academy membership community, it's actually quite a lot of work to uh, maintain a membership community and to do it well. And it becomes almost like a second job. Uh, and I don't think either of us thought it would be that way. Um, and then you've got people paying a monthly thing and you want to give them value and you don't want to like, you know, make them disappointed. And uh, you end up feeling beholden to paying customers for providing a consistent monthly service. Uh, which is fine because it's how like business and stuff works. But given that we didn't want to treat this podcast as a business, it felt a little bit counterproductive. What do you think? Yeah, I think, um, I think we underestimated the amount of work involved in actually making it active. I think I was kind of, I was kind of expecting, oh, you know, we'll start the Slack group. We'll kind of bring, bring a bunch of people together and, you know, some magic would just happen. And, you know, we'd organize some semi-regular events. And then people would just, like, you know, make friends with one another and, and kind of do their own thing. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, we, we, we organized, you know, for the first bunch, of, I think for the first, like, month or two, we organized, like, weekly weekly Zoom calls. with you know, And we had sort of 25, 30 people, I think, joining each of these. And they were fun, for sure. But, again, there were some challenges around, like, you know, if you have a Zoom call with 25 people, how can you make sure that everyone gets to contribute, all of this kind of stuff? And then, then we experimented with, okay, how do we like, you know, maybe we can have smaller smaller calls. You know, 30 people is a lot. Maybe some people are scared to contribute. Um, and, you know, then we, we, we had a few smaller calls and some of them were good. I think just like ultimately for you and me, uh, it's it just wasn't enough of a priority that like, and yeah, like doing these weekly Zoom calls, they typically have to be on a weekend because that's when most people would be free. And then it's like, okay, now, now every every Sunday of mine is, you know, kind of has this big chunk of time out of it where I can't have any other plans and things like that. And so, um, yeah, I think having those regular events is very disruptive. Mate, how do I turn on Do Not Disturb on this Big Sur Mac? Um, you click that little thing next to the Siri button in the top right and click Do Not Disturb. Oh, okay. I think that should work, yeah, because the Slack and messaging notifications that you're getting, you're very popular indeed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we've decided to do what <laughs> exactly what we did with my part-time YouTuber Academy membership thing as well, which is that we're closing it down and refunding everyone all of the money they've ever paid for it. So uh, if you are in the membership community, then thank you very much for uh, being part of this uh, experiment, uh, as it were, for the last few months. But you will be being returned all of them, all of the cash that you've ponied up for it. And yeah, I guess we'll just keep the Slack group active because we might as well, if anyone does want to and continue to make friends on that. But it's, yeah, it, it, it's really not, like I think it was, it was good that we tried it as an experiment, but when we realized that actually we're charging people for a thing that is a fairly low priority for us, then it's just a bit unfair to continue to do that. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll keep the Slack group picking about. There, there are maybe like, maybe about once a week, I, I think there's like quite an interesting discussion in there about something that someone mm -hmm. posts and it's, it's really cool to see that. Um, so yeah, big thank you to everyone who was, who was and is part of the Slack. I'm sorry mm -hmm. that we didn't really do it justice. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for giving it a go with us. Yeah. In, in, in terms of other updates. So we are, we're actually recording this on a Wednesday evening and it, it I can't believe it's, it's taken us like two years to realize this, that part of why <laughs> recording this podcast weekly has actually been quite hard is because we always would record on a Sunday and Sundays are like a social day where, you know, if it's, if it's the middle of lockdown and there's nothing to do, then sure, we'll, we'll record remotely on a Sunday evening. But now that lockdown is easing up, like 
I've had plans basically every Sunday evening. You've had plans basically every Sunday evening. Things have been happening. And I think it was Angus who suggested that, hey, why don't you guys just record midweek? Like, you don't have to record on a Sunday. I was like, oh, my God. That's actually a revolutionary insight. So we can yeah. just, like, have a recurring calendar event on, like, Wednesday evenings. That Wednesday evenings is podcast evening where we hang out um, with one another and just do the podcast. So yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed, that'll mean uh, this and future episodes are going to be on a more consistent basis uh, rather than sporadic as they've been as they've been recently because, as you all know, we are sticklers for consistency when we can. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's nice that lockdown's over and there's stuff to do on the weekends, <laughs> for sure. Cool. Any other kind of life updates? I, I have a few. I feel like we should, we, 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 we should exchange one each. I have one from last weekend where I went on a low social optionality weekend trip with uh, some friends. This was actually uh, bringing two groups of friends together who hadn't previously met. But actually, a majority of the group had been previous guests on this podcast. So we had oh. Lu Lucia, we had Joey and Mac. Uh, Mac, had, Mac and Lucia and Joey had not met before. And then we had a friend of mine from university and his wife. And so, um, you know, kind of sort of uni friends of mine plus, you know, podcasts slash other friends of mine, you know, bringing the two worlds together. Um, yeah, it was how, awesome. How we, was it? What were the vibes? The vibes were great. We rented an Airbnb near Wolverhampton. We were mostly limited by Airbnbs, so we booked this about a month ago, and I think everyone was basically trying to go on weekend holidays um, as, as the lockdown was easing up, and so we didn't we didn't choose a Wolverhampton <laughs> and then find the Airbnb. We, like, found a cool Airbnb. It was a sort of big kind of... Uh, manor house kind of thing and we had like one one sort of wing of it or whatever um yeah just like really old building super cool vibes um yeah the weather was phenomenal last weekend as well so we did during the day we did like a bunch of you know typical outdoorsy stuff of like going on a walk sitting on some grass for a few hours chatting you know that kind of thing and then in the evenings we play board games uh, at the house i think it, it turned out that like most of the people there were pretty serious board gamers so we probably oh, had yes Glorious. probably like 10 different board games uh, i tried a bunch of new ones that I played Monopoly Deal for the first time, probably. Oh, that's pretty good. Pretty solid. Yeah. Played one called Seven Wonders. That was quite elaborate, but like kind of got the hang of it in the end. Pretty solid. Uh, and then there were another couple. Uh, the names escaped me. And then we played some of the some of the classic stuff that we always play, like uh, Snatch, which is a, a variation of Banana Grounds. We played some Dobble. We played some Avalon. Um, you know, all that's the hits. Pretty, pretty solid vibes across the board. It was solid vibes. The, yeah. only, the only thing I, I know about Wolverhampton is it's where Liam Payne from One Direction is from. Really? Yes. Yeah, I mean, this was near Wolverhampton, but it was kind of in the countryside, um, which was quite nice. I think the thing I didn't appreciate was that basically the whole of last week I was quite sleep deprived. Um, and I was expecting to catch up on sleep over the weekend. <laughs> and that just did not happen. Uh, we were sort of up playing board games quite late every day. Um, and then waking up the next day to go and do stuff. Uh, but it was really fun. And I've I basically a couple of months ago I've I sort of resolved to do one of these every month, and so the previous month we went to Cornwall together. I think the month before that we went to Brighton. I don't think I have anything in July, so I'm I'll um I'll get something in in the calendar for nice. July. Yeah, but now August. lockdown is becoming more of a thing as well, so <laughs> that's always yeah it's sort tricky of spanner in the works. I'm trying to think whether there are any like particularly good insights from. Yeah, I was going to say any any insights from the, uh, from yeah, the yeah, social yeah. optionality trip. Uh, for for the newer listeners of the podcast, you might have missed our spiel or rather table spiel about social optionality um, many moons ago. Uh, just so just to quickly summarize the the idea is that um, often yeah, we 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 have an episode called "Why Do We Hate Networking Events," which is one of our most popular episodes, I believe. Where we're saying, you know, one of the reasons why networking events and like big parties and stuff are so bad for a lot of people is that there's a lot of social optionality. And if you're speaking to someone and you're not immediately vibing with them, you know, it's very easy to exit that conversation without any real social costs. And therefore, you can just go to a different conversation. And the nice thing about like a group holiday is that it's a low social optionality event in that you can't just not hang out with someone because you don't really vibe with them because there's a group, a small group of you on holiday together where you only really have one another to hang out with. Um, and we've talked about how that like low social optionality fosters a lot, a much more like interesting human connection where you give someone more of a chance and you find actively find ways in which you've got commonalities rather than dismissing someone because they seem, I don't know, 
white and sports playing, which is not the sort of vibe that I am. Therefore, I'm not going to talk to them. Therefore, I'm not really going to get on with them. That, that sort of thing that we're, we're, we're prone to do for uh, stereotyping others in high social optionality situations. That was a good explanation. I don't think I, don't think I came up with any insights, unfortunately. Damn, I, I guess we just had a fun weekend. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Nightmare. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> right. <laughs> I need. I need to get one of those Elgato. You know those Elgato Stream Deck things. Where yeah, you yeah. Buttons, so you can do buttons in front, so yeah. I can be like, as soon as like you know, because <laughs> <laughs> there, there is that like half second delay, which sort of ruins it. Yeah, and it's you saying, "Wait, hold up, hold up," <laughs> while you find the button to press to make the sound effect. <laughs> All right, um, that was uh, that was an update for me. Lenny, what uh, what, what you got for us? Uh, so I've actually been in Oxford, your your hometown, uh, for the last two days. Nice. How was Sheen it? and I went down on Monday Monday evening. Uh, she was there for some like business school event because she works at the business school. She was like, "Hey, do you want to go to Oxford for two days?" And I was like, "Yeah, right. Why not?" Uh, and I intended to do to go as a sort of write, writing retreat. I was like, "You know what? I'm going to bang out the, the the entirety of my chapter four of my book." Wow. Uh, which is all about autonomy. I was going to bang that out in two days. It was like four thousand words each day, eight thousand words by the end of it. It's going to be lit. Yeah. Uh, it turns out I didn't actually do any writing at all. Oh, wow. Because on day one, when I intended to, I, I posted a thing on my Instagram story being like, hey, I'm chilling outside this coffee shop in Oxford if anyone wants to come join. And like 13, 14 people like joined for the next few hours. And it was like a really nice kind of vibe where, you know, there was there's this area in Westgate Shopping Center. Where it's like, you know, open area with like fake grass on the floor and deck chairs. Yeah. I stationed myself on a deck chair with my iPad and people just came and joined and have a chat. And then people left and then people joined. And there was at, in the, at the end, there was like a group of 12 of us. And that was really cool. We were there for a few hours. Um, and then I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to do some writing. Uh, went to Sticks and Sushi to have lunch. Posted that on my Instagram story. And again, more people joined at Sticks and Sushi. So that was really cool. <laughs> uh, so there were like four four people who joined there. Had a bit of a chat. Um, and then, yeah, I hung out, hung out with Sheen and her like work colleagues who, you know, were, were cool. And then another friend came over. It was like a whole, a whole day of like various types of social interaction. Which was what actually these, much more fun than writing would have been. What are these like mini meetups like? I think we've touched on this before, but like, what's the dynamic? Isn't it isn't it weird that they're all there to kind of hang out with you? Like, isn't isn't there this weird like one to many relationship? Um, I thought there more there would be. I don't I don't think there was. I think I was holding court a bit more than I normally would in a group situation. Um, but beyond that, like people were like when. It, when it was sort of a group of up to five people, it was like the same conversation. When it broke off into, when it, when it got to a group of like 12 people, then at times there were like, you know, m multiple different conversations happening within the group. I'd be talking to one group and then another group would be having their own conversation. Mm. Also occasionally, um, you know, when I was, I was, I was, do I was doing some uh, research for the book at the, at the same time. So, uh, you know, if there was a bit of a lull, I'd be like, all right, guys, so um, I, need, mm. I, I need some thoughts about this thing that I'm working on. Have you got yeah. any examples from your life where A, B, C, D? And then people would be like, oh, you know, this is an example from my life with that. And then I'd kind of take notes on the iPad and someone else would chime in and talk. And so that oh, was cool. yeah. a very easy yeah, scaffolding yeah, yeah. for conversation to happen in a fairly natural sounding fashion. Mm. In a way, almost like an icebreaker, but it was more like, guys, I need help researching for my book. Therefore, we're doing this. Yeah, Rather yeah. than, right, guys, let's have an icebreaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that was actually that was the, that was pretty fun. That sounds like a good setup, yeah. Yeah, and there were quite a few times where uh, there was like me and then our friends Sheen and, uh, and Nabila. We were just chilling outside some cafe, having some ice cream, and like in in the space of about three minutes, like four people came up to us, like recognizing me from the back of my head. I was like, oh my god, it's Ali Abdal. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, yeah, some people, so some of them recognized Sheen as well. Had a bit of a chat, took some photos. It was it was a very nice like experience that I haven't had with that with that frequency for a very long time. Yeah, so, so you, in, you enjoy being a sort of a celebrity out on the town. I love it, mate. It's so good, especially when like 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 the power of social media. You can just post an Instagram story, and you know, hey, I'm in Oxford. Any anyone wants to hang out? And there there were like tens of people wanting to hang out. One guy even came all the way from London because he was like, right, this is my one chance to meet Ali Abdul. Oh wow, okay. <laughs> so yeah, he was cool. Uh, he's he's a YouTuber as well. Made a little vlog out of it, and he was like, yeah, it's a bit of an adventure. So why not? What do you think folks are looking to get out of? Um... A meeting with Ali Abdal. I'm I'm actually not sure. Um, I think, I mean, I think if someone like I don't know if <laughs> if someone that I followed on the internet, I don't know if if Tim Ferriss or Derek Sivers or Austin Kleon and still around holiday, whatever, we're in we're in town. 
I'd want to be like, oh, hey, do you want to hang out? Like, not because I want anything from them in particular, just be like, hey, it would be kind of cool to meet this person that I've been following on the internet, IRL. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that was that was broadly it. There were a couple of people who had like, oh, you know, there's one question I've really, really been meaning to ask you. Um, are you really as productive as you, <laughs> you claim to be on the internet? You know, that, that kind of thing. Nice, yeah. yeah. But it was mostly just a, a very chilled out vibe of just wanting to hang out. At least that's what it seemed like. And it was quite like okay. a diverse range of people, mostly uni students or like, you know, masters, PhDs. <laughs> couple yeah. of like you know people actually with with real jobs a couple of like yeah. kids who just finished the a-levels um so pretty pr pretty wide range nice that sounds pretty good any mm -hmm. insights any insights i think generally in a group setting i realized that i am not particularly comfortable like holding court and having the attention on me and it feels a bit weird um but in this context i like had that moment of like this feels uncomfortable initially and then I very quickly got over it because I was like, okay, in this particular context, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is your job. <laughs> this is literally my job. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, th and so that, 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 that automatically became, became yeah. fine. And I noticed it like, you know, in the, in the car on the, on the way home from Oxford, uh, we had Angus and um, Sheen's manager from work in the car as well. And Sheen's manager's end up was really cool and was doing a really good job of like telling stories and like holding court. Yeah. And I was just sort of like admiring that as like, oh, wow, like she kind of read the situation, knew that like, you know, some I didn't I didn't really know her. Angus didn't really know her. And so she was like, yeah. you know, talking about herself. And we all really appreciated that, that she was keeping the conversation going. Yeah. I was thinking that's interesting, like knowing when to actually w w when it's actually OK to tell a story about yourself, because yeah, I always yeah, yeah. feel like, oh, my God, I don't want to yeah. I don't want to be too I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I don't want all the attention on me. I want to give people the chance. I don't want to talk about my life. But it's it's those things that do keep keep the vibe going especially when when people are not entirely like don't know each other very well yeah yeah that's something i'm, I'm becoming more comfortable with and, and starting to kind of notice when like when it's you know in a in a group setting when it's basically my job to now just like talk about something for like you know 60 seconds you know just to lubricate the uh mm. the wheels yeah, I find, I've actually found that um, uh, un unconditional parenting is a great lubrication. <laughs> really? Yeah. Every, yeah every, mate, everyone's got an opinion on it. Mate, yeah, I, I'm surprised how much it comes up. Like, I don't even bring it up. So, like, I think... Uh, <laughs> you I, don't even bring it up. I don't... I genuinely don't bring it up. Like, for example... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> like, we, you know, we had this sort of afternoon tea for a like, weekend before last, like... Uh, a week and a half ago or something with um with friends from school right and i think i th okay I, I don't know how it came up it, it definitely came up about half an hour into the conversation and i i think someone someone mentioned oh yeah tame like i've been seeing you like do do these tweets about like this parenting stuff or something like that so i, th I think some, someone mentioned something like that and then i remember you went on like you know it seems like you'd been listening to the audiobook or something and you went on this like impassioned speech about like how amazing this book is and just how like it was Guys, anyone anyone listening to this you have to read the book unconditional parenting or listen to the audiobook it's so sick yeah it was really nice to see you kind of shilling for it and like you were like really passionate about it i haven't seen you that passionate about something in a long time and you were just like going on this rant about how good this book is and what it's about uh to to kind of the gang and it was it was just so nice to see you know? oh i'm glad i'm glad you enjoyed it yeah, because I've been I've I've been hearing this stuff from your mouth, <laughs> sort of yeah. in in, <laughs> in uh, bits and drabs for the last like year or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this guy, he's literally thought of every, everything. He's like put it all in one place. He's got like he's got like responses to the common objections of like, well, you know, if you let kids do whatever they want, then they're just gonna go kill themselves or so stupid. He's, he's like, it's, it's just so well thought out. It's, <laughs> and I'm like, damn, this is somebody, good stuff. Yeah. How uh, how does that feel for you, knowing that like the stuff that you've kind of been independently, somewhat independently thinking about, there there is actually a body of work on this, and some dude thinks exactly the same stuff that you do. It's great. It's incredibly validating because most of the time, like most of the responses I get, are, you know, people kind of shooting it down, saying like, oh my god, like you know, you don't wait until you have kids of your own, then you can start talking about parenting. Like, who the hell is this guy? Kind of thing. And like even on the podcast, you know, you're always like pushing back against this stuff, and um, and Mate, yeah, I'm fully, I'm, I'm fully sold on it. To be honest, <laughs> have you finished the book? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I actually haven't finished it myself. So. <laughs> Funny, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we did. We definitely need to do like a, a solid episode 
I've yeah, have you have you have you emailed episodes. Alfie asking if he wants to be on the pod? I actually have not, but that'd okay. be great. Mate, then add that to your whatever Apple reminders you use for <laughs> to do list management right now. Yeah, I actually don't have any such thing, but uh, I'll do it. Sorry, I have really bad hay fever. The downside of the the handful of good weather days we get in the UK is that it really kills my allergies, and so there's a lot of eye rubbing. My uh, my sinuses are congested. Oh, man. man. Sounds like life is really tough these days. Yeah, unconditional marriage just seems to come up all the time. Like, we had, um, Lucas and I have got our flat back in London uh, as of I don't know, a few weeks ago. And we had some friends over for dinner, like, I don't know, last week, week before last, something like that. Um, that was amazing, actually. That was, like, so much fun. There was, I don't know, like, six, six of us or something. Basically just sat around the dinner table for, like, five hours straight just like hanging out it was from like i don't know 8 p.m into the early hours of the morning and yeah just a ton of fun just like sitting at a dinner table and talking and like yeah I, I remember like um emily one of the girls had like the just like the funniest anecdotes about you know a bunch of stuff i i, I have not laughed that hard in yeah probably in the, in the past year it was just at, so funny and like it was just so much fun and just like great vibes overall and I, I really missed kind of you know hosting friends and just sitting and chatting for ages with a you know, in a safe space with a trusted group of friends but i think layout i think layout really matters for these things like for example i think your flat is not very conducive to that kind of thing like in the living room you know there's like a there's like a two-seater sofa next to it there's like an armchair and it's like well what else do you do then someone has to go and sit at your desk and then maybe on some people on the floor and stuff and so you can't really have the same thing because of the layout, like genuinely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think in the in, in the next place I move into, I definitely want a dining table. <laughs> yeah. You know, who who'd have thought <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> having having a dining table would be like a nice thing? Yeah. Because before I was, I was like, oh, what's the point of a dining table? We can just eat on the sofa; it's fine. But yeah, yeah. The vibes vibes are a bit different. Yeah, definitely a bit different. Um, um, so there's been a few social sessions in the past few weeks. Have we got any topic in particular to talk about today? Okay, there must be some more stuff to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah I feel like I've, I've, I've actually seen you in real life fairly recently, and so these aren't quite the sort of. What about your haircut? Oh, I had a, I had a haircut today. What do you what, what do you think of my haircut? I've I've had a a skin fade for the very first time in my life. I feel like you're starting. Yeah, you you're starting to look a bit like a Dubai boy. So yes, <laughs> that's what I'm going for. I just need the abs now. Uh, the abs. Uh, abs, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm 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 working on that too. Uh, but I, w I, w I went to this like barber shop in Oxford called Young Sons. Was that around when you were there? It was like opposite Grand Cafe. There was always a barber shop opposite Grand Cafe. Yeah, I can't remember the name. Yeah. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Um, and for the very first time in my life, I they were like, well, "What would you like done?" And instead of being like, "Oh, I don't know, you pick," I <laughs> got my phone <laughs> and I showed a picture. I was like, "All right, is it is it doable to do something like this?" Yeah. Uh, my current haircut looks nothing like the picture. Right. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> I thought I thought that was like that was a step in the right direction, and now I feel more confident. It was a picture. Oh, it's just you know I, I I found something on Pinterest like fifty curly hairstyles for men, and it was like you know this sort of fade thing on the side, but like longer curly hair like going forward. And I was like that would be pretty cool because I have yeah. longer curly hair at the top, uh, but it ended up being just this pure sort of Dubai boy look. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Hey, you know, got to got to lean into the stereotype. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I I remember I liked your previous haircut. Um, the video quality is kind of rubbish for, uh, on my end right now, so I'm not sure exactly what this looks like. But it, yeah, I'm getting uh, I'm getting Dubai boy boy kind of vibes. There's something which I have been thinking about today. It is based on a tweet. Did you, have you have you seen this tweet doing the rounds? Basically, some some guy called like side hustle something. He tweeted something like, would you rather have $1 million today or $50 a month for the rest of your life? <laughs> and then he goes, I choose option B because it's passive income. <laughs> passive income. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've, I've got like well, well, hang on. Was this guy taking the piss or was he being right? Sick? Right. So I, th I, I thought this was a genius troll. Hmm. This was like, side hustler kind of guy 
poking fun at side hustler, you know, yeah. kind of <laughs> kind of uh, narrative of like, oh, passive income. Would you rather no? I I take the passive income. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're like oh, obviously fifty dollars a month is <laughs> the worst the worst option out of the two, no matter what you're, you're what you're optimizing for. <laughs> and then and then another guy <laughs> kind of joined in. Uh, we've talked about him on the podcast before. A sweaty startup. His name is Nick oh, Huber. Yeah. He's, he's, he's also often talking about like, yeah, making money, you know, business kind of stuff. And he replied like, yeah, I'd go for option B, you know, <laughs> $50 a month can pay my phone bill and my phone makes me more money. $50 a month pays my internet bill and my, you know, the internet makes me money. <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and then, <laughs> pretty good. And then, some, and then someone like replied to him seriously saying, I, I don't know, just some like serious reply. And he and saying like, Dude, like, if you take the million, you can still do that stuff. And then he was like, yeah, and what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I just I just tell my wife and kids that I got this big handout. <laughs> like, what kind of a man does that make me? <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> it, was, it was just so funny. Like, Nick Nick Huber was obviously trolling. I'm, I'm 99% sure that the original post was a master troll. But at some point in the thread, he says that, oh, sorry, that was actually a typo or something. So that might have just actually been a typo. Maybe he meant $5,000 a month. I, I, I don't know what numbers would make sense. But <laughs> like, I thought this was like, I thought it was a really obvious troll and like a really masterfully done troll. Yeah. However, the interesting thing, right? The interesting thing was the the tribalism that sparks from this, right? Because, oh, you know, okay. yeah. there's like there's like one you know tribe of people. Um, who are like, you know, side hustles, passive income, yeah, go to rise and grind, you know, all, all of this kind of stuff. Love it. And then there's, and then there's like a tribe of, pe a tribe of people against them, you know, who kind of think it's, it's kind of silly. It's kind of tacky, you know, life isn't about grinding, you know, all, all, the, all this kind of stuff. Mm. And, um, and the people in camp B, um, the people in camp B who are against the, against the hustle culture kind of mm. thing, you know, I think they generally consider themselves to be, uh, you know, smart, thoughtful, rational, you know, not susceptible to tribalism, things like this. Okay. Um, but I thought, I thought the interesting thing was that even though this was a very obvious troll or at the very least a very obvious like mistake, like it was just obviously like, n obviously this person was not being serious about a million dollars versus $50 a month. Mm -hmm. Right. But all of these people on the other side, these, you know, people who are, you know, generally considered to be smart, thoughtful, rational, reasonable, you know, unemotional when it, when it comes to these things, they all chose to kind of dunk on it and hate on it. And they chose not to see the fact that like, this was obviously not legit. Mm. And I think that's super revealing. I think, I think it's always super revealing when a group can, a group can espouse a, a, a certain set of behaviors. Um, and under most circumstances, their behavior matches that set of aspirational behaviors of yep. being like, you know, anti-tribalist, un unemotional, rational, all of this kind of stuff. Like 95, 95% of the time, 99% of the time, you know, based on the stuff that comes up, mm. they operate within that mode. But crucially, I, I think like the, the, the crunch time comes in the 1% of times where it is tempting, where it might be tempting to break out of that mode and be mm. a bit tribalist and start hating and dunking and all of this kind of stuff because the out group is stupid. And I thought it was super interesting that a bunch of them ended up doing that uh, in this case. And like, I would, it, yeah, it just made me think that like so much of like what kind of person, what, what kind of people we think we are is based on the 99% of the time where it's easy for us to be that, that kind of person. Yeah. When actually, what matter? What you know? What matters is the one percent of the time where it's not easy to be that kind of person, um, and whether or not you still do it anyway. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've 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 been thinking about that sort of concept where like I'm 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 doing this like sort of life life coachingy type program uh, with this coach guy who I know uh, that's aimed at uncovering like what your values are and what your kind of life's mission and stuff should be. Yeah. And well, whenever we talk about this thing of what are your values, what are the values you want to live by? You know, there's a list of like 200 values that most people would probably agree with, you know, honesty, integrity, compassion, kindness, making a difference, helping people that, that you know, ambition, and you know, all, this, all this sort of stuff. Ambition the idea is that you, uh, you know, one, one way of figuring out your values is you look through one of these lists of values and you pick the ones that most resonate with you. Yeah. Um, 
And a, a value like, you know, honesty or integrity or stuff like that. I mean, obviously, every, every single person will, will, would broadly agree with that. Yeah. But the, the interesting thing to think about, and the, the, this applies to like, like you know, va core values of a business as well, is that when it's a choice between that and something else, which is the value that's going to actually come out on top? So like, you know, that 1% of the, you know, most of us are honest and integral, Integ integrative whatever the word is <laughs> uh we uh, but most of us are honest and we have integrity like 99 percent of the time but it's it's in those like clutch moments where mm. uh <laughs> it's actually tested that yeah it starts to it starts to manifest itself and we and and you can go through life or you, or you can spend a lot of time sort of being fairly confident that you are an honest person until the point where you're not <laughs> uh and so yeah w with this w with this tribalism thing like what were the kind of an anti-hustle people saying about that? Were they like specifically dunking on the million dollars versus $50 or was it, were, was it more like, I don't know, yeah, a, a general me, vibe of like, oh my God, this is what's wrong with the world. Let me get my phone. Because like, I, I, I feel like I had a semi-similar case a few days ago. Um, so a few, a few months ago, I, I tweeted out the phrase, nothing is fun as a full-time job. Oh yeah, I saw that tweet. And I I tweeted that out so sort of semi, you know, tongue in cheek, semi like, you know, leaning into the whole hustle culture, passive, you know, multiple sources of income kind of vibe. But also semi semi seriously because I do strongly believe that very few things are fun when you make them a full-time job. Yeah. Um and then uh, you know, we posted a screenshot of that tweet on my Instagram. And there was a lot of there were like a couple of people in the comments that were like very against the phrase "nothing is fun" as a full-time job. There was one guy who subsequently deleted his comments. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure why. Cause I think it was it was it was very reasonable. You know, he said, "I'm an." He, I looked at his profile. He's an anesthesiologist in Canada. He was like, "See, this is this is what's wrong. What's wrong with your stuff? You're making people feel bad for having a job. You know, I enjoy working overnight to save my patients' lives, and you're out here telling people that having a full-time job is not like fulfilling. Some of us actually enjoy our jobs. You just got lucky, kind of vibe." Yeah. And then there was, you know, uh, lots of kind of yeah, that, the, that comment got like 50 likes uh, and there were a sort of like a thread of people kind of arguing against him. But like, oh, that's not what he's saying. That is what he's saying. He's what's wrong with the world. He's what's right with the world. The, the, this sort of stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of sad that the, the dude deleted his comments. Um, but, but I thought that was interesting because right? I think his, his problem clearly wasn't with that specific tweet. It was with the general vibe that he thought I have, which is, you know, m apparently making people feel bad for having the audacity to have a job, uh, which I don't think is something that I particularly espouse, <laughs> but maybe, maybe it comes across that way. I don't know. Like I can see where he's coming from. I can see where he's coming from. Sure. Like, I probably wouldn't tweet that. Like, obviously I, c I can see where you're coming from as well. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the th <laughs> I think the thing to think when it's something you, know, you, you read a tweet like that is okay. Under what circumstances might this be true? Mm. And let's kind of think about why that might be the case. Like, there's not going to be any pithy tweet that is always true under all circumstances, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so, sure. yeah. like, yes, you could you could look at any tweet. It's not true under all circumstances. Mm. I like my job, you know, whatever. Um, so, like, I don't know, I think that's, that's not a, it's not a terribly useful way to interpret tweets in general. But... Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't tweet something like nothing as fun as a full-time job. But why did you tweet that? Um, I think it was around the time where I was sort of getting a bit bored of making YouTube videos and I'd, I'd switched from being a full-time doctor to a full-time YouTuber and kind of had this like, you know, somewhat pithy sounding, somewhat controversial sounding insight that like nothing is fun as a full-time job. Okay, but like, yeah, and, I, and so I thought, oh, hello, this is this is tweetable. Let's go for it. If if you imagine someone reading that tweet, hmm. what kind of positive takeaways do you think there would be from it? The positive takeaways, like, I'm presuming you want the, <laughs> you want this tweet to have some kind of positive impact. Oh yeah, uh, I mean, I think from 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 the comments of the tweet and the Instagram post, the positive comments are like, oh yeah, you know, this is why it's really important to have a balanced life, and to do multiple things if that's what you're into. So you think you 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 kind of had in mind that someone might someone would read this tweet. Nothing is fun as a full time job. Mm. I think, 
you know what? Yeah, it's really important to have a balanced life. Um, okay, really? I mean, I'm I, I'm not going to pretend that the reason I tweet I, I tweet things is to have a positive impact in the world, <laughs> right? Okay. So um, why did you tweet that? Why would just I tweet that? Just because it was like a controversial kind of statement, which is yeah, a fair reason to tweet. Because it's kind of funny. It's it's true under a lot of circumstances. I felt it was to apply to my life there. I knew it was a, it was a controversial statement. It was uh, packing a lot of stuff into a very small, pithy sounding thing, which okay. I knew would that some people would like really resonate with, and some people really wouldn't. And yeah. so I thought, oh, you know what? This is a funny, funny thing to tweet out. Yeah, I guess I yeah, I think it's like a just a, a sort of a controversial kind of tweet that's meant to elicit some kind of response hmm. um, from either side. I think it's it's the kind of thing where like the people who are already on board will be like, yeah, you know, yeah. screw jobs, oh, exactly. <laughs> and, the, and, and the people who have jobs will just kind of feel bad <laughs> about it. It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess it's not. Yeah, I guess my fun. job isn't that fun. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, like so I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess there's a there's a there's a, there's a time there's a place for. Controversial tweets for the banter. I have nothing against that, but like, I get what the guy was saying. You know. Oh yeah, I'm not. I'm not like saying that what what he's saying isn't true. Um, I was making the point that like similar to your tweet about like million dollars versus fifty dollars, yeah, kind of thing that there is a camp who is like broadly in my in in my camp of yes i agree nothing as fun as a full-time job yeah i want to have side hustles i don't want to be shackled to a job that i might not enjoy yeah and there's the other camp that sort of isn't really in engaging with the the merits of that particular argument oh i see yeah, yeah, yeah. and instead going like well, yeah well some of us enjoy working our full time you know i enjoy working overnight to save my patients and stuff like that and if we really push down, push, push comes to shove, you know, if you ask those people that, okay, but like, you know, let's say you've got kids, would you like the option of taking a day off every week to spend more time with the kids? Yeah. yeah. You know, very few people would be like, oh, actually, no, I, I love my full time job so much that I would I would choose to work 80 hours a week. Yeah. Even if I didn't have to. Uh, and, and, and so in a way, it's, it's sort of like the, the anti, you know, the, 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 the people who are anti that particular tweet yeah. were, I think anti it for like again identity yeah, reasons yeah, and yeah, like I, not yeah. feeling bad about themselves rather than anti it because they actually yeah. disagree with the argument as a whole. Yeah, yeah, I think they'd they'd probably put you in a I mean look yeah, I think I think there's like a, a hustler camp in which you would be yeah. and an anti hustler oh, camp in yeah. which they would be. And uh your your tweet has very like hustler uh vibes and they'd kind of read you know, someone might read that and think, Oh, I mean, but it's but it's weird. Like my my yeah. tweet also has very anti hustler vibes. <laughs> huh? My I feel like my tweet also has quite anti hustler vibes. <laughs> In that it's encouraging people to work part time, <laughs> which is really, just really, really all I'm doing. Uh no, I don't think that's what it's doing. Oh, like, come on. But no, I get what? that that tweet comes across as being in the in the hustle camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Despite, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, ostensibly anti hustle message. Some of the responses to this fifty fifty dollar mm -hmm. every month or million dollars thing. Or uh, Lamau, this is the dumbest thing I've read in a long time. <laughs> so, <laughs> if I were you, I would take the one million so I could afford basic education. <laughs> <laughs> and then some people doing the math: fifty dollars every month. That's six hundred in a year. That's thirty thousand in fifty years. Bro, are you high? Um, you know stuff like this. Um, yeah. Anyway, I just thought that was funny mm. because, like, the people who usually decry tribalism, uh, you know. Some of them seem to be being kind of tribalistic about this particular thing. Sadly, um, I think that's. I think it's also interesting in kind of. It's interesting to see, you know, there's there's often like little squabbles between uh, tech and the media. You know, tech as in like, uh, you know, Silicon Valley types, and the media as in like old school media, like you know, newspapers, stuff like that, New York, New York Times kind of thing. Like, there's often you know fights between the two sides about different issues broadly tech feels like uh, the media, the traditional media kind of make their money from being super negative, being really pessimistic, basically shitting on tech because it's an easy target because people in tech are trying to do something, you know, different, you know, trying to make a change or whatever. And it's very easy to like shit on Facebook for, you know, all sorts of things and all this kind of other stuff. Right. And so that's kind of the common battle. And I'm always a little bit surprised to see the tone of the tech folks 
when some of these battles actually happen, you know, like once a month or once every couple of months. Because I think these are generally people who take a very different tone in interactions and, you know, would, I, I would, um, you know, would maybe want to be seen as being like above that kind of sort of pettiness. And I think I do see a lot of pettiness come out during the, during the uh, tech versus media squabbles on Twitter. Uh, and it's, it's just quite interesting to see. Hmm. Yeah, fair. I can't say I have any particular um, opinion on that, given that I don't particularly follow the tech media squabbles on Twitter. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking earlier today, I was uh, lamenting to Sheen that it w w w one context in which in my life I've attempted to combine tech and media is in getting a subscription to the Economist app. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and every, every few months, I, I go through a, f a phase where I refresh my Economist subscription, thinking, you know what? Economist Espresso, I'm, I'm going to read that every morning. And then, yeah. you know, the, the, the world in brief every week, you know, how hard is it just once a week, just reading yeah. the world in brief, just to be a little bit <laughs> aware of what's going on in the world. Yeah. And, th and then I do it for a day or two. And then I'm like, you know what? I actually just don't really care about any of this. And yeah. I go back to scrolling Twitter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the source of all my news. So I don't know. I, I'm very, like, Im impressed when people actually have knowledge of current affairs from <laughs> following tech and media and stuff. Why are you why are you impressed by it? I think I mean I'm impressed by it. It's similar to how I feel impressed, like if someone has. I I I I feel impressed when someone has like wide wide ranging knowledge about. Like wide ranging multidisciplinary knowledge because it shows that they're interested in lots of things that they read a lot that they you know, clearly engaging with stuff. Right. Um. I I I wouldn't praise them for it. You know, crucially, but oh, I would be naturally, like naturally. In, inwardly impressed by that. Oh. Um. And so, like, you know, I've got a, a friend who is, like, super clued up on all of the interesting things going on in, like, politics in the Middle East. And, you know, we're like, all right, what's the deal with Israel and Palestine? And he'd, like, explain it from, like, okay, okay you know, we, mm. the, we've got to start by going back to, you know, 600 BC. And, yeah. you know, then we go down and then the story of a time. What's the deal with Turkey? Okay, well, Turkey's a bit complicated because blah, 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 you know, what's the deal with mm -hmm. Iran? Okay, well, funny you ask, because Iran's a bit complicated because blah, 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 yeah. and, and just seems to really know all that, all that sort of stuff. And that's yeah. a place that I would love to be in because I know that, like, there's so much cool, cool shit happening in the world, but because yeah. I don't have a framework or a baseline framework on which to hang that knowledge, mm. it just feels like random bits and bobs here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember when, like, at one point, I think it was a few years ago, when I was driving a lot to placement and back in med school, where I started listening to the Hardcore History podcast by Dan Carlin. And there was, like, this six-episode series about World War... Was it World War One or World War Two? World War One, I think. Yeah, World War One. And each episode was, like, four hours long. And so I, I'd listened to, like, 24 hours of podcast content about, like, World War One, oh, And wow. it was so, so interesting. It was really, really cool. And I remember now, like, like even now to this day, when when I hear stuff referenced in like a museum or history or a book or something or between yeah. about that period, yeah, it feels so much more colorful because I have an, yeah, a, yeah, a knowledge yeah. of like a, a pretty decent knowledge of what went on in 1914 to 1918. Yeah. Yeah. And I would love to have that for the because I feel like that's like, uh, you know, we're we're literally like we're we're living through history, history being made, um, and. I feel like I'm kind of taking a back seat of that because I just don't understand the wider context, of the wider context and the things that you should need to understand for that stuff to make sense. Yeah. I can, I can watch a Vox video here and there that explains, I don't know, the Israel Palestine conflict or, or whatever yeah. and be like, Oh, okay. I kind of get that for like five seconds and then it, and then it all goes. And now, and the next time I hear of like, you know, yeah, the West bank, I'm like, okay, where is that? What is that? Like, how does it, how does it work? How does it fit into the things that I know? Yeah. Um, Hence why that's impressive. Hence why I, I try taking out a subscription to The Economist every couple of day, every couple of months. Uh, but it, it, it never quite works. And so the, this is something I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. I, I need to pull my friends who are very well informed about current affairs, about like a sort of beginner's guide to sort of <laughs> recent world history. Yeah, um, yeah. But I guess that, that again, that, that, that also feels too, too broad. And maybe it is about actually like understanding sort of just potentially keeping up to date with the news and then when something strikes my fancy be like oh why is that kind of trade deal with iran like a big deal then yeah exploring yeah. that particular rabbit hole but i don't know any any thoughts on this yeah I've, I've had a similar experience from the ages of like probably 17 to 22 about once or twice a year i will i would get a subscription to the economist 
they'd pile up in my room unopened in the little plastic bags <laughs> that I'd cancel it and rinse and repeat the following year. Yep. So there were, there have been periods in the past where I've aspired to be included up about current affairs. Um, I just find it hard to be interested in it, to be honest. I think, um, I think I've, I've mostly concluded that um, there's not too much point, you know, for me you know, uh, to, to, to read up on that kind of stuff. I think, um, yeah, I, I read stuff about the domains that I'm interested in. You know, I get, I, I'm, I'm very like up to date on latest stuff, um, for, for like tech and the t tech adjacent things from Twitter. And then I like read about other things that I care about, but, uh, I'm not, I'm not terribly sold on the value of keeping up with current affairs. I do. I, I'm very much sold on the value of, uh, having a broad knowledge base. I think knowing about, um, lots of different kinds of things does make life more meaningful. Like if you are, are, if you know a lot about trees, if you're really into trees, then a walk in the woods is very different for you than it is for someone who doesn't know about trees. And if you know about birds, then, you know, hearing, you know, being out and about and hearing, you know, birds chirping is a very different experience than if you don't know about birds and stuff like that. So I, I'm, I'm totally bought into the, the value of, you know, knowing, knowing about things. I think current affairs specifically, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, I, I, I do think there is something there around like feeling a connection to the rest of humanity and, and that kind of stuff. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's quite abstract. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that if I have that broader context of, of the world, then when stuff happens in the news, it's like, oh, that's that's really cool. That's really interesting because ABCDE. Yeah. Rather than, oh, okay, something happened in the news. Yeah. I think yeah. similar to the trees example. Like imagine if any time, you know, basically every day when you read the news in the morning, you were like, you could uh, you could actually understand what's going on because you appreciate the word context. You could put yeah. that thing in with the thing. Be like, oh, that's an interesting take about, you know, s similar to how you keep up to date with the latest tech stuff um, and you find it interesting when stuff, when, when the, there's developments in tech. Uh, I mean, broadly, current affairsy stuff generally affect, affect, affects, has, has the potential to affect just as much, if not more, as like the latest tech app that's out there. Um, you know. I mean, yeah, like the c current affairs is, is definitely like, yeah, like it's definitely stuff that's more important than the latest mm -hmm. tech app. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not like intrinsically interested in it. Yeah. Um, and it seems like that, you know, I'm sure I would be if I knew enough about it, but mm. that's, it seems like quite a big, big hill to climb before I can get there. Yeah. If anyone has any recommendations for books, for audiobooks preferably, that give it a decent introduction to important things that you just found engaging, then I would love to hear it. The other audiobook I've, I've started listening to is, uh, on, on your and Imran's recommendation, is Slavery and Islam. Yeah. What do you think? That's good, uh, right? It's it's very very interesting. Like, I I thought it was going to be dry, but it's really not. It's like ridiculously engaging. Yeah, the author is really good. A guy called Jonathan Brown. Yeah, he's just awesome. Yeah, and like in the in the introduction, he really like lays it all out there. And he's he's like, all right, you know, Muslims have a bit of a problem with 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 the idea of slavery. Obviously, slavery is bad, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Um, but clearly, slavery was condoned by the Prophet and is is like a thing in the Quran. And so, how the hell do you like answer that particular objection? Mm. Um, and like, you know, in 2014, ISIS suddenly announced that they were like taking slaves and they were going to have sex with their slaves. And, you know, Muslims around the world were like, oh, crap, like it's, uh, <laughs> you know, that is that is a thing in the Quran. Um, but you can't like say it's bad because then you're going against the Quran or you're going against prophet. It's like, you know, creating this whole mess. And he's like, OK, this is really, really complicated. This book is the is, is you know, my, my attempt yeah. to answer that that thorny question of like what, what yeah. the hell yeah. is going on with slavery in Islam? Yeah, and so I'm, I've I think I finished chapter one now, and chapter one is all about like defining slavery, which is mm. like sounds weird, but like huge kind of know, worms in itself. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a huge kind of worms. Like how the, how the hell do you do you define slavery? And he, yep, yep, yep. Any any attempt made to def I mean, he he caveats it at the start with being like, you know, obviously this is an incendiary issue. Um, you know, slavery is one of those things whereby it is sort of very prescient, very kind of like there in people's minds, depending on what demographic you're from. For example, yeah, if you're a black yeah. person, then the thought of slavery is like, like an actual thing that affects you. Whereas yeah. if you're a white middle-class person like this guy is, then it's a sort of, 
oh, you know, lol, the British Empire, you know, we probably shouldn't have done that. Let's brush it under the rug type type, type situation. Um, it's interesting because his point there is that like, you know, all of our all of our definitions. Like he's, he 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 goes off on this whole thing about definitions that I've just never really really considered. It's like, mm. well, well, what is it like? Um, there's like fancy philosophical terminology for it: n n nominalism versus realism. Okay, yeah, uh, I, I can't remember the details. Yeah, so realism is 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 the thought is is the idea that you know there, are, uh, you know when we well, when we have categories for things, those categories actually exist in the real world. Uh, okay. Whereas nominalism is like those categories and the, 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 there are things out there in the real world, but the categories are sort of in our minds. Yeah. 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 Um, and so he uses the, the example of like a dog and a bear and how like, okay, you might try and define that a dog is like, you know, a small creature with fur and like four legs and blah, 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 blah. And that mm. defines a category of dog. And you might say a bear is a bigger creature with like four, yeah, four yeah. legs, a bit, a bit hairy, blah, blah, blah. That defines a category of bear. Um, but really when you see a dog, you know, it's a dog. And mm. <laughs> if you saw something that, you know, technically fit that definition of bear, but actually look like a dog, you would e you would either ignore the definition or you would redefine dog to include that thing that you already know is a dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how we do this for everything without even realizing it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 so for stuff, you know, there's that famous uh, judge who said, you, you, when asked to define hardcore pornography, he said, I don't know how to define it, but I'll know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. um, and he says it's it's similar for things like terrorism and slavery, whereby. It's very, very hard to actually define, and it really yeah. is a case of I'll know it when I see it. And terrorism, for example, generally means, oh, it's you know a crime that was done by someone that doesn't look like me, or a crime that was done by a brown or black person, generally a brown person these days. Yeah. Um, and any attempts to define terrorism end up getting like weird, w weird things that are on the periphery that you certainly wouldn't define as terrorism, but fit into the definition. Yeah. And similarly with slavery, any attempts to define what the hell slavery actually is you end up in this absolute mess where there's lots of stuff that fits that definition that clearly isn't slavery and lots of stuff yeah. that clearly is that doesn't fit that defi definition. And so his, his whole thing is about, like, okay, you know, uh, when, when we say, when, when we use words, we should be mindful about like the fact that we have, we have used a word for something means that we are creating that category in our heads mm. to generally mean, you know, th that thing that I think looks like this thing. So yeah, when, we, yeah. when we say slavery, normally the, the images that come to mind are the transatlantic slave, slave trade, people with dark skins, chains, you know, people being treated yeah. as property, people being like dehumanized and like physically punished, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and his point is that actually, you know, slavery is this whole like absolutely vast thing that has like changed like so much across time and across cultures that yeah, yeah. you find it with that very kind of transatlantic-y kind of yeah. imagery that we have from films like 12 Years a Slave and stuff is not entirely legit. And and so he, he kind of tackles that in the first chapter. And then he's like, well, you know, at the end, at, at the end of the first chapter, he, he kind of, kind of makes the point, but like, okay, kind of, you know, you, you know, all these definitions aside, let's just, let's put all of the, all of that aside and let's just define slavery as, you know, I'll know it when I see it because we all kind of know what slavery is in our heads, yeah, even yeah. if we can't define it. And then, you know, in further chapters, he goes on to, to, to talk more about it. Um, the, the, the one I, I'm, I'm most looking forward to reading is chapter four, which I think is called the slavery conundrum. Um, and what he says, this, the, the, the slavery conundrum is, you know, it's, it's, it's not the conundrum that, you know, is slavery good or bad? Because obviously slavery is bad. The conundrum is like, why was it, why has slavery only been considered bad for the last 200 years? Like, yeah. Why is it that like, you know, philosophers and prophets and, you know, all of the people that we look up to and venerate and respect and, and idolize from the past, from before the 1800 none of them had any problems with slavery at all. <laughs> and yeah, that's really yeah. weird. Like, you know, it's not that that humanity suddenly had this like moral awakening where all of a sudden yeah. in 1850, we realized slavery is bad. Like it's, it's pretty weird that Aristotle and Plato and like all these fancy people and all the prophets and like, they all, they were all all right with slavery. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I think, I'm I think that was kind of where, the, where he goes the, there. Yeah. The biggest thing that stuck with me from, from the book is that question of like, you know, Lots of people have been thinking about morality, ethics, all of this kind of stuff for a very long time. Yeah. And they didn't conclude that this is like bad or, mm. or like that this is, you know, you know well, we, we kind of consider it like, you know, one of the worst possible things nowadays. Yeah. And like, you know, why is it the case that, you know, for, for like millennia, you know, the you know, people who had done a lot of thinking and, you know, for, for what we can see, genuinely cared about you know, getting to 
a good set of morals and, and ethics and things like that. They didn't think it was bad. It's pretty weird. Yeah. Pretty yeah, weird. It's yeah. It's an absolute banger of a book. Like, it sounds like a very niche topic. Like, it does, slavery, yeah. <laughs> slavery, like super niche, yeah. Specifically, slavery as it relates to Islam. But it's actually just like a really good general book about kind of philosophy and how to approach these kinds of things. And like, yeah, just a general concept of like slavery and, and how to approach that philosophically and uh, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I do often find that they're like, but there are books and topics out there that sound super niche, but are actually like surprisingly generally applicable, interesting, relevant, valid, all of this kind of stuff. <clears throat> I think slavery and Islam is, um, is one of them. I've said this before on the podcast. I think um, books about parenting, another books about education, another like this is all stuff that sounds super niche. Like, oh, I'm not a parent. I don't really care about that. Why would I read a parenting book? Or like, oh, I'm not a teacher. Why would I read an edu education book? But like, it's just super relevant to tons of different things. Mm. Yeah, there was a, a thought I had while while listening to Slavery in Islam and kind of kind of being very impressed as to how engaging and accessible it was, which is that I think when I was younger, I lumped books like that in the category of this book will be boring and it's not for me because it wasn't like, I don't know, Alex Ryder or Cherub or, or things like that. And yeah. I've just sort of held on to that general idea that, oh, OK, a book looks like this and has that title. Therefore, it's not for me. Um, oh, really? And I was I was just sort of thinking about that. I was like, oh, hang on. I'm a I'm a grown ass man now. You know, I'm I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty well educated. I can understand big words. And for yeah. some reason, I just hadn't quite questioned that. Oh, you know, this book is a bit dense. It's a bit hard to read. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As like, and and that is, you know, in the in the past was my my reason for just in my mind dismissing books that feel that felt that seemed kind of academic and dry as being academic and dry. Yeah. Uh, but actually, now if I gave them a chance, especially in audiobook format, you know. Yeah read by someone who is a good audiobook narrator yeah it's actually like broadly very accessible um another one that I, yeah. I i really enjoyed in my third year is called iq and human intelligence because i was studying psychology and iq was like one of my, one of my favorite topics and i literally read this entire textbook like academic like cover to cover and it was so 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 interesting and i never would have given it the time of day because it looks like a dry academic textbook um so now I, I, I want to find more stuff like that where it's like, oh, you know, an engaging read written by someone who spent like, you know, 20 years researching a topic and can actually yeah. just give the whole thing with lots of new ones and lots of background. And you just end yeah. up learning like loads of cool stuff that way beyond just the topic of slavery and Islam or beyond just the topic of yeah. IQ and human intelligence. Yeah, 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 exactly. I feel the same way about fiction books. <laughs> if, I, uh, if there's a book title, like if there's a book that's like a storybook kind of mm. thing, and and the title is yeah it's basically like a fiction book. I'm like oh no I don't, I don't know how to read that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not sure I know how to read it. Yeah, I can, yeah. I can recommend the fiction whole, wholeheartedly. But yeah, slavery in Islam is banger. All right, we better wrap things up there. My hay fever is getting really bad, and it's uh, it's almost bedtime. Cool. Do you want to read out a review? I'm not sure if we've had any recently. We haven't put out an episode in a while, but oh, we had a we had a three star review recently. Uh, from someone in Ireland. It's entitled Unpredictable. It's a three-star review. I enjoy this podcast when it comes out. It's a little sporadic, which is disappointing. Three-week gaps between episodes are common. Also, they seem to be having more interview-type content, which can be a little sycophantic. I don't know what that means. Uh, I much it, prefer... it means arse-licking. Oh, okay. I much prefer when the lads are just talking about a topic rather than trying to just flatter a guest. Um, yeah, fair comments. We have had three week gaps recently. We've had a lot of interview. Um, I don't interview think we, 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 we try to just flat for a, a, a guest though, but maybe sometimes it comes across that way. Um, yeah, I think inevitably all interviews do kind of come across that way. Hmm. Like I get it. Um, but yeah, no, thanks for the review. Sorry for the inconsistency. Sorry for the, uh, the sycophantic. To read. The sy sick of fancy, I think. Is, the... is that is it actually? You know, yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, okay, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for the review. Anyhow, we will uh, we'll do better. One nine eight nine three six three in Ireland. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening, and we will we will actually see you next week. Are we going to publish this? We might as well just like publish this tomorrow. The whole like Monday thing, like. Yeah. Um. I mean, I feel I feel like it does make sense to have a sort of a a, a day to publish. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so let's keep it on Mondays, just so people have a, a big expectation of what's going on. Okay, that makes sense. All right. 
Thanks um, for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. bye. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on the Apple Podcasts website if you're not using an iPhone. There's a link in the show notes. If you've got any thoughts on this episode or any ideas for new podcast topics, we'd love to get an audio message from you with your conundrum, question, or just anything that we could discuss. Yeah, if you're up for having your voice played on the podcast and your question being the springboard for our discussion, email us an audio file mp3 or voice note to hi at notoverthinking.com. If you've got thoughts but you'd rather not have your voice played publicly, that's fine as well. Tweet or DM us at N Overthinking on Twitter, please. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.